good evening to everyone and welcome to today's session <clears throat> today we have a very interesting topic related to physics strabismus is one thing which we are going to review then we left anatomy half the way so we will finish the remaining part of the anatomy and also we will have a review today on uh, indirect and direct ophthalmoscopy corneal ulcer is another important topic so we have a long journey to go <clears throat> we welcome our online students from mandya manu renuka priya jabalpur kumar kavi deva tirupati guntur vaisak etc etc <clears throat> now please inform that the live class started to the people huh? so what is strabismus normally if you look at the visual axis of the two eyes they will be parallel to each other whenever we are having a primary position of the gaze and this alignment parallel alignment is maintained in all sorts of gaze when you look up look down look right look left it will be maintained any misalignment in this visual axis of the two eyes is basically called as strabismus or squint first thing is what is the classification of strabismus <clears throat> so uh, we have a apparent squint really the child doesn't have any misalignment but when you look at him in shadi.com you may feel that this guy has got uh, or this girl is having strabismus maybe they have a very prominent epicanthal fold which may give a wrong appearance as such they have got strabismus such a kind of situation is called pseudo strabismus then we have latent squint that is normally when you see that guy you don't uh, identify that he is having a squint he is basically called as heterophoria then we have a manifest squint that is when you look at him in the primary position only you will recognize eye is deviated hence he is having squint that is then called heterotropia heterotropia can be in turn divided into concomitant squint or incomitant squint is the broad division that we have now what is pseudo strabismus pseudo strabismus the visual axis are in fact parallel but it seems that they have a squint quite often pseudo strabismus will be seen you can see we are feeling that this eye is inward deviated right but it is not it is this prominent epicanthal fold which is responsible for it then in the pseudo there are two ty types of pseudo strabismus pseudo isotropia where wrongly you may get impressed that the eye is uh, eyeball is deviated medially pseudo exotropia so there are two kinds of uh, pseudo strabismus so what are the causes where you will mistakenly think that the both eye eyes are uh, medially deviated if there is a prominent epicanthal fold or if there is any negative alpha kappa so that can lead to the development of pseudo isotropia then what is pseudo exotropia some of our classmates in the first year mbbs will be checking which is the beautiful eyes which is the beautiful nose etc because we are fortunate to live with them for five and a half years five years in medical school five and a half वन ईयर हाउसमैनशिप भी मिला के अगर फेल भी हो गया तो सिक्स ईयर्स सो सूडो एक्सोट्रोपिया बट दट बॉय सिटिंग इन द कॉर्नर ऑफ द टेबल ऑफ द लास्ट बेंच रियली डिड नॉट हैव एनी स्क्रीन वॉट ही हैड वॉज ए हाइपर टिलोरिज्म विच हैज मेड एस टू फॉल्सली थिंक दैट ही वॉज हैविंग एक्सोट्रोपिया 
so hyper tellurism or a positive angle kappa can lead to the development of pseudo exotropia is what we need to appreciate then the second major category is called latent squint latent squint is also called heterophoria so in this people the visual axes are basically mal aligned they are not parallel but the person will be using the ability to fuse the retinal images we have some accommodative ability to fuse the retinal images using the fusion that squint will not be visible you use any maneuver to break his ability to conduct a physiological mechanism of fusion a physio physiological compensatory mechanism of fusion of images then the squint become evident so such a kind of a squint which is not generally evident but only on the dissolution of the fusion which become evident is basically called as phoria is what need to be remembered so we do various tests asking him to fixate and try to break the fusion and then the squint become typically evident in a lot of people physiologically only there will be some amount of heterophoria all of our eyes may look normal as such we don't have squint but some amount of squint will be there which is compensated by the fusion and we don't manifest anything so that is physiological heterophoria now what are the various types of heterophoria doctor if you break the fusion then the deviation of the eyeball will vis become visible no so how it is deviated based on that we have the subtypes esophoria if you break the fusion if the eyeball gets converged then that is medially it get deviated then you basically call esophoria then what is the cause for this esophoria maybe the muscles responsible for the convergence of the eyeball that is medially medial movement leading to convergence they may be overactive or maybe there can be a weakness in the muscles responsible for the divergence which can lead to development of esophoria which is a medial deviation on breaking of the fusion so convergence excess type how will you recognize whether it is due to the convergence excess type it is one of the mechanisms for this esophoria if you ask the person to fixate to the near object if the esophoria appear then that is because of convergence excess when you ask the person to fixate to the distance object and when the esophoria appear then when we look at the distance object our divergence muscles must be working but if they are weak so because of their weakness there is a development of esophoria towards the distance than for the near so that is how we recognize whether the esophoria is because of the convergence excess or the divergence weakness is what need to be remembered now let us have a quick uh, uh, look at how we elicit this what is meant by orthophoria typically you will place the eye which you are testing under the cover so when the person is looking straight either with or without cover with cover there is no deviation when looking at a when fixating the view towards a particular object then it is called orthophoria which is a normal situation then what is meant by esophoria typically uh the eyes are straight until the 
left eye is covered the moment it is covered then uh, it become deviated medial position ko it will get medially deviated under the cover because here you are breaking the fusion if you break the fusion then the phoreas will come out so it got medially deviated so that's how you recognize esophoria then you kept the eye under the test under the cover and the other eye is fixating then if it is exophoria initially both the eyes are straight but uh, the moment one eye is uh, looking at an object the other eye typically will go into outward outward deviation which is exophoria so summarized doctor phorias are fundamentally those latent strabismus where the alignment of the eyes is normal until the fusion is not broken by doing a covering test cover uncover test we are breaking that fusion and when we break then the eye can either get deviated outward or inward if it is inward it is so if it is outward it is exophoria now in some people there can be esophoria which is neither increased because of when the person fixates to distance nor it will increase when he fixates to near then such a type of esophoria is basically called as non specific type we don't know why it is happening so summarize doctor once more if the esophoria is more when the person is fixating towards a near object then it is due to convergence excess if he is fixating towards a object which is uh, uh, far then it is due to the divergence weakness if neither of them uh, are uh, i mean if both of them if it is uh, associated then you call it as non specific now exophoria so exophoria is a tendency to diverge then the opposite factors are true for exophoria it can be due to convergence weakness or divergence excess how will you elicit whether it is due to convergence weakness if there is an exophoria occurring whenever the person is fixating for a near object so if you look for esophoria even esophoria which is appearing when the person is fixating towards the near then it is due to convergence excess exophoria which is occurring when the person is fixating to near then it is due to convergence weakness okay so that is as simple as that then what is divergence excess how will you recognize exophoria which is more on distant fixation than for a near object is basically due to divergence excess whether for distant or near if the exophoria is appearing whenever he fixates then you call it as non specific type so these are the few things as a parrot you must be able to remember then what is hyperphoria deviating upwards you can see the eye is typically deviating upward direction are you able to appreciate upward deviation hypophoria is a tendency to deviate downwards but neither of them will be there in a primary position only when he is fixating then only they will appear so that's what need to be remembered then what is meant by cyclophoria obviously whenever he is fixating the globe instead of uh, horizontal or vertical movement obliquely getting deviated so it is rotating around an ap axis so whenever it is rotating 12 o'clock position uh, nasally then uh, it is called in cyclophoria if it is going outward 12 o'clock position is going outward then you temporarily then you call it as ex cyclophoria so what is the cause for this uh, why people 
do not manifest squint when they are not fixating and why do they manifest when they are fixating what are the underlying etiological factors responsible for phorias let us be very sure there could be a orbital asymmetry after all, our calvarium is a big box of multiple holes foramina so orbital asymmetry abnormal interpupillary distance suppose if there is a wide interpupillary distance it can lead to exophoria and a small interpupillary distance will lead to esophoria there may be a faulty insertion of the extra ocular muscle there is no convergence excess convergence weakness divergence excess divergence weakness any of them can develop because of faulty insertion of the extra ocular muscles is what we need to basically remember please give to dr sahab uh, notes huh? <clears throat> now there can be weakness itself in one of the extra ocular muscles there may be an anomalous central distribution of the innervation to the two eyes normally what is the sherrington's law equal amount of innervation should go to both the muscles right so if the innervation is not equal for both converging and diverging muscles then also that can lead to a phoria where the squint is not visible in the primary position only when fusion is there then it become visible then any anatomical variation in the position of the macula in the two different eyes that could be possible one eye can have one place my macula other can have in other place which can lead to the improper positioning of the falling of the images so then the brain can get confused and can develop people can develop phorias age typically esophorias are more common in the younger age group exophorias where our eye get deviated out is more often seen in the elderly what do you have here typically the person is fixating when he is fixating his eye is getting deviated which eye doctor our left is there right right now is there any role for uh, accommodation and refractive errors in the development of the phorias yes sir any increased accommodation will lead to esophoria in which conditions we need to use more accommodation for example hypermetropes if you are a hypermetropic individual then you need to use your accommodation more excessively and that is associated with esophoria medial deviation so all our classmates who read a lot in the reading room will end up in a good rank in entrance but at the same time a esophoric eye bones so that is the reason better upload your photograph before md entrance in shadi.com baad mein esophoria develop ho gaye to don't blame me huh so uh, or uh, then any decreased accommodation for example you are having myopes that big eye bald fellows they can develop exophoria is what need to be remembered these things look very simple but in entrance when they ask you to remember perfectly myopes are what hypermetropes are what you must be very clear about i can say more easily to remember this fact is myope means big eye ball a big eye ball is protruding out of the orbit and going out you can easily imagine a newborn baby small eye ball is uh, deviating and looking towards the nose it's very common newborn babies when you see they will be looking towards their nose right so esophorias are more common in hypermetropes now doctor i'll give you one classical example this this child who has got hypermetropic spectacle correction before the correction of his hypermetropia when he is trying to fixate what is he developing 
isotropia. But after you have corrected his hypermetropia, the isotropia got corrected. So yesterday we solved one question, no? If there is a squint, what do you want to do first? First I want to know whether any refractive error is there. Is he excessively using his accommodation or under using his accommodation? If he is a myope, he is under using accommodation and that lead to exotropia, exophoria. If he is a hypermetro, it lead to isophoria. So correct his hypermetropia, then isophoria is also vanishing. So that's what we need to remember uh, for the tomorrow's exam. <clears throat> now what is the role of convergence? As we have said, we are going through the etiological factors. What is responsible for this phoreus? Any excessive use of convergence, we said no convergence overactivity or divergence underactivity are the ones responsible for isophoria. Few kids fundamentally are congenitally myopic. In them there can be development of significant amount of isophoria. Any decreased convergence, for example, presbyopic individuals when they become elderly 40, 45 years, when you become associate professor of medicine, it is difficult to read Harrison. So ideally by the time you are expected to not read Harrison anymore, but practice Harrison. So your residents must tell you what is there inside the Harrison. But presbyopes with a decreased use of convergence, Typically, will develop exophoria. Then, if somebody use, is using only one eye, constantly only one eye, then the dissociation factor because of the prolonged constant usage of only one eye can lead to development of exophoria. So, if you take MD pathology, which phoria you can get, doctor? MD pathology may exophoria, you are using only one eye. Watchmakers who use uniocular, they will be repairing watch only using one eye, no? I don't know whether humans are still repairing watches or uh, uh, there is a computerized repair, whatever. <clears throat> so, uniocular magnifying lens also lead to development of exophoria. Now, doctor, if I am having a phoria, normally when I am looking, there is no deviation of my eyeball. Only when I am fixating, then I am developing it. So, do you think, will I have any symptoms? There are two kinds of phorias. I mean, symptoms can be compensated heterophoria, just like congestive heart failure. Decompensated Heterophoria, where because of the phoria, latent squint, they will start developing symptomatology. So compensated means there are no subjective symptoms. So why few people go into decompensation? Why few people will be asymptomatic and will have compensated heterophorias? It depends on how is their reserve neuromuscular power, which is able to fuse the images. And what is the desire of the individual to maintain a binocular vision? Naturally, you know, it's a voluntary activity to fixate. So, suppose if I am an uh, aeroplane driver or a pilot or if I am a plastic surgeon, I need to fixate my eyes. So, obviously, I will try to develop better compensation. Decompensated means that latent squint lead to certain symptoms. So what are the various symptoms of a decompensated heterophorias? Typically there can be symptoms of muscle fatigue, there can be headache, eye ache, if you close the eyes, the it will relieve. Then it becomes difficult to change the focus from the near to distant objects quickly. Fixation cannot be changed that easy, fast. They can develop photophobia. So they may prefer to use dark glasses. Then 
they can be symptoms which are due to the failure to maintain a binocular vision the moment there is a heterophorias they can be blurring and crowding of the words and there can be intermittent diplopia intermittent uh, deviation of the eye even though it is phoria phoria means by rule what should be there phoria means there should not be any deviation visible deviation but they can develop sometimes a visible deviation of the eyeball intermittently then there can be symptoms to for defective postural sensations for example it become difficult for them to judge the distances due to the loss of the binocular vision because our binocular vision is responsible for perceiving the depth so cricketers tennis players pilots during landing so uh, instead of catching the ball he may catch the other players neck so that can happen if there is any decompensated heterophoria so how do you evaluate a case of heterophoria heterophoria is that silent thief who is hiding behind so you need to bring it out by breaking the fusion or making the eye to fixate so basically you should always test the vision for refractory error that's the first thing to do quite often refractory error is the one which is responsible then we do cover uncover test which we have seen typically it will tell whether there is any heterophoria if so then is it is or exophoria so to do this one eye is covered with occluder and the other is eye is made to fixate an object we have seen an earlier picture he was fixating the dog in the presence of the heterophoria the eye which is under the cover is getting deviated because of the breakage of the fusion if it is medially deviated isotrophia euphoria if it is laterally deviated you call it as at the time of fixation you call it as exophoria then uh, uh, so this is all the quick summary of what we have already discussed cover under cover test then we do another type of test which is called as uh, prism cover test prism cover test there will be huge description in the textbook but if you know the principle you don't need to go through all that if you remember prism cover any cover think of heterophoria so in prism cover test also we use a prism in order to basically break his fusion and try to bring out this quint that's what we are trying to do then medox rod another favoritely asked mcq in the exam lot of times this question comes medox rod has a lot of glass rods made up of red color what will medox rod will be doing it will be converting a point light image into a line so patient is asked to fixate towards a particular point line in the center of the medox which is being uh, which is held at around 6 meters away then uh, when the patient sees the point light with one eye and the uh, and the red line because it converts a point uh, source of light into a red line and the red line with the other there are dissimilar images of the two eyes and the fusion is broken and then the heterophoria become manifested so that's what you will basically do with medox rod ultimately medox rod for heterophoria 6 meters that are the ultimate buzzwords you need to do by reading four five times you don't become an optometrist optometrist is not even a doctor he is the one who prescribes the spectacles and he is a physicist fundamentally eh? but for entrance yeah you need to get the working knowledge of uh, the ophthalmology so medox rod is the one which is also used for testing the binocular vision then if you don't like medox rod then you can use medox wing even the basic principle of wing also is the same that is dissociation of the fusion by dissimilar objects is the whole idea so how do you treat doctor when do you treat 
the moment it become a decompensated heterophoria a latent squint where i e is paining i am unable to approximate the distance of objects i lost my perception about the depth i need a good depth because i am a pilot then you need to treat so how do you treat first as yesterday vikas rightly said vikas sir manu said uh, roof r for refractory errors must be corrected o for orthoptic exercises right another o is occlusion therapy then comes surgery roof actually ha huh? all right so correction of refractive error is very important then orthoptic treatment suppose if there is no refractive error responsible then we use orthoptic treatment then if there is a refractive error in spite of using glasses if there is no relief then orthoptic exercises so what is the main aim of this orthoptic exercise doctor you are giving them a practice of improving their convergence insufficiency and the fusional reserve it's like our mock tests on sunday and saturday so by giving you test what are we trying to do number one we are trying to challenge your enthusiasm that's all doctor knowledge is secondary first is you should have the passion enthu energy then automatically seat in entrance will come even if you do dm cardiology and you go to the opd like a compensated congestive heart failure guy with the wife in the verge of giving a divorce and another son becoming narcotic addict and uh, you are writing same digoxin with uh, what is the use of reading so much so as medical students once upon a time medical college student with an apron means it is much more delightful look than seeing the director general of police in his five uh, stars but uh, i don't know i hope the same charm is still there so what is all needed is energy doctor energy to get two principles if you don't understand don't by heart it that's the rule you try to find a reason then those things which required to be by hearted useless stuff for entrance big list will be there no try to develop some logical way with the little energy available so that is the orthoptic exercise that weakened convergence is strengthened fundamentally so if you are using an orthoptic exercise it can also be done using a synoptophore then you can also prescribe a prism in the glasses in order to correct uh, the problems of uh, uh, accommodation etc then surgical treatment very simple in surgical treatment only two things are done uh only two things are done either weak muscle ko strengthen karega strong muscle ko weaken karega that's all about the surgery of strabismus so these are all principles of latent squint which is called phoria then comes tropia what is that concomitant squint which is also called manifest squint otherwise now the other day we studied one paralytic squint no paralytic squint so in the paralytic squint what is the hallmark in a particular position if the person tries to see then the deviations everything become more prominent but in this the amount of the deviation of the squinting eye remains constant in all the directions of gaze if it is not due to paralysis but a non paralytic concomitant manifest squint then in case of paralytic squint typically there is a limitation in the movement of the eye it is deviated in primary position deviation ke sath hi sath agar kisi direction mein dekhna hai to for example abdusens palsy bit is there 
if you want to move your eye laterally, it is not possible. But as in case of concomitant strabismus, there is no such limitation of the ocular movements because it is non-paralytic, fundamentally. So summarize what we have seen. A latent squint which is a phoria, a manifest squint which can be tropia, which is concomitant or that means non-paralytic or it can be paralytic or it can be incomitant. So there are the various forms of uh, manifest squint. Now what is the etiology? Why this without paralysis? Why this uh, manifest uh, deviation of the eyeball is happening in them? Typically if you look at the binocular vision of us and the coordination of our ocular movements, they are not developed at birth. At birth, one eye will be going in one direction, other eye will be going in another direction. Have you not seen a newborn baby's eyeballs? You will be thinking, why not my baby is looking towards me? Is she angry? I am not asking it to prepare for any entrance exam. But the eye will be gliding here and there. Within about 3 to 6 months, slowly the baby's eyeballs tend to look purposefully in a direction. And by about 5 to 6 years, our uh, binocular vision is fully developed and coordination of the ocular movements is perfect and the child can go for Olympics in the shooting competition. Now, any obstacle in the development of this binocular vision and the coordination between the ocular movements can lead to development of a concomitant squint, even though there is no paralysis of the extraocular muscle. Agree, doc? Now, what are these obstacles? What is preventing the binocular vision from developing? It can be sensory, it can be motor, it can be central in the level of the retina and visual cortex, anything can be responsible. Now, what are the sensory obstacles? Suppose, if one eye is receiving a clear image of the world and the other eye, because of some pathology, is unable to receive a proper uh, image, clear image, then that can prevent the coordination between the two eyeballs from developing properly and the binocular vision from developing properly. So, any refractive errors developing when the child is during his uh, binocular vision developing age or any anisometropias, corneal opacities, lenticular opacities, any macular diseases in the childhood or any optic atrophy, any obstruction of the pupil like a congenital ptosis, any of them can deprive one of the eyes from the sensory perception of the visual image and the other eye receiving it normally, then there is a loss of coordination. It is similar to our home's doctor. Elder daughter received less attention from dad. Younger daughter is pampered. So obviously they lose the coordination and uh, they develop a sibling rivalry. At the same time love-hate relationship. So that is the problem of concomitant uh, squint. Any motor obstacles? For example, uh, for the two eyes to maintain in a proper positional relationship uh, and the coordination for the ocular movements to develop, there must be certain motor factors. For example, if there is a difference in the size of and shape of one orbit and the other that can make one globe to move freely, other globe less freely. That can lead to loss of incoordination, I mean loss of coordination, loss of binocular vision. Any faulty insertion, faulty innervation or a paresis, any problem with the accommodation, similar things as what happens in the case of the phoreas, but these are interrupting the binocular vision leading to tropias. So, any abnormalities of the accommodation or the convergence or a AC by A ratio, similarly any central obstacles, third type, any of them can lead to development of concomitant 
non paralytic manifest squint which is called as concomitant strabismus which is a tropia now what are the different types of tropias tropia can be unilateral only one eye monocular it can be alternative sometimes one eye next time other eye next time this eye next time that eye so alternating squint it can be an inward deviation which is an isotropia it can be an outward deviation which is an exotropia it can be a vertical deviation in the primary position itself which can be hypertropia now you still remember we discussed in paralytic squint the strabismic eye itself will have some amount of deviation in a primary position which is basically called primary deviation then when you ask the strabismic eye to fixate and put the non strabismic eye under a cover then it will deviate which is called secondary deviation but secondary deviation is more than primary deviation in the case of the paralytic squint but in the case of concomitant non paralytic squint tropias primary deviation is equal to the secondary deviation point number 2 you should not forget because this is one of the favorite issues for the examiner very good our online classmates are parallelly nowadays preparing and coming to class so that uh, the teacher can be little more careful uh, while uh, saying even a word so most of the times only teacher is prepared guy in the class so always there is a confidence that uh, i assume that none of you have studied but if you study you will discover a lot of mistakes in the lecture eh? so that's good today we have 47 viewers still three short for the half century no problem some of the viewers are in the live class i believe eh? right so how are the ocular movements ocular movements are not limited to one particular direction unlike in the case of the paralytic squint then refractive error may be there may not be there without refractive error also there can be atrophia then there can be suppression and amblyopia which can develop if at all the atrophia is because of any sensory impairment sensory cause leading to the impairment of the binocular vision then there can be av patterns which can be associated with the horizontal strabismus i'll come to what is meant by av pattern as we go further see doctor these are the most important points out of the 7 8 points about concomitant squint frequently mcqs are asked in the entrance without any is there anything to by heart in this no except this av pattern i'll clear then remaining things are logically rememberable you need to remember because this is the topic which is that uh, uh, what we call hot topic for the examiner where lot of students don't focus on strabismus if you are able to read strabismus in ophthalmology renal tubular acidosis in medicine glomerulonephritis in pathology septic latrin in spm and insecticides in spm aha you are there are all the telltale signs like like braxton hicks contractions the chance of pregnancy hagar sign ke jaise telltale signs of pregnancy rehta na doctor what are the telltale signs you are going to get seat in md entrance if you have red slow sand filter rapid sand filter what is the type of uh, hygrometer what are the classification of insecticides in spm and strabismus in ophthalmology aha still your brain is working you did not develop any necrotic lesions in your uh, limbic system then you are going to get the seat so that's very important you need to reach the remotest corners of the topics all 1250 topics you must be in a position to revise now let us see let us demonstrate this if you see the ocular movements are they limited doctor they are not limited he can nicely see the classmate who is sitting to his right to his left but when he is trying to see towards the teacher one of the eye gone deviated medially so this is an example of a tropia 
then as in case of paralytic strabismus ocular movements can't be free like this he can't move the eye in a lateral direction if at all there is a paralysis of the uh, lateral rectus agreed now what are the different types of concomitant squint as we already discussed it can be convergent it can be divergent exotropia where the eye is deviated out eye is deviated in you call it as convergent and vertical which is basically called hypertropia one to comments about each of them we will try to conclude convergent squint it is that inward deviation of one eye in the primary position itself it can be unilateral the same eye always deviates inwards and the second normal eye takes the fixation right or it can be alternating that is either of the eyes can deviate inwards and the other eye takes up the fixation alternatively is called alternating type now clinico etiologically if you take the underlying uh, etiological factors into consideration how can you classify a convergent squint similarly clinico etiologically how do we classify the divergent squint then after that with treatment we will conclude very simple accommodative isotropia is one of the types of isotropias convergent squint any overaction of the convergence at the time of the accommodation reflex what will we do doctor when we whenever we are reading the book our both eyes will come into medial position if this is becoming excessive then that can lead to development of isotropia why should there be any overaction of convergence it can occur either association with any refractive error or without refractive error or a mixed type any subtypes can be there in this accommodative isotropia but fundamentally problem is what excessive accommodation is leading to isotropia is what you are going to remember then in this we will talk about refractive subtype of an accommodative isotropia typically this problem develops by the age of about 2 to 3 years and these children typically have got high degrees of hypermetropia kitna hypermetropia hai to accommodative isotropia will develop doctor nearly plus 4 to plus 7 diopters of hypermetropia in a pre school going child 2 to 3 year old then that will affect the binocular vision and that lead to development of a refractive it is due to refractory error because of which there is excessive working of accommodation leading to the medial deviation hence you call it as refractive hypertrophic i mean refractive accommodative type of isotropia found in hypermetropic children with plus 4 to plus 7 diopters mostly this will be more for the near than far that is if you look at that uh, medial deviation of the eye in primary position there is a medial deviation it will be altogether more medial deviation whenever the person is trying to read the book so it is because of hyperactivity of the accommodation and if you use a spectacle it is fully correctable you see this is the typical glasses for the hypermetropia once you have placed this medial deviation gone when you remove spectacles eye becoming medially deviated so this is the refractive accommodative isotropia in hypermetropic children is what we need to remember now this is what i like to once more reinforce isotropia without hypermetropia ka correcting lens with that it lost is what need to be remembered then there can be a non refractive accommodative isotropias so in this people the problem is not with uh, uh, refractory error 
without refractory error like hypermetropia only, the recommendation is hyperactive. Hence called non-refractive accommodative isotropia. How do you know that uh, the recommendation is hyperactive? We calculate what is called as AC by A ratio. Accommodative convergence by accommodation ratio. Don't go too deep into what is this, how do we calculate, etc., etc. That is not for uh, 19 subjects, 6 months time. So, just to learn the Carnatic music only for the purpose of singing one song in the matrimonial meeting. After that, uh, you will sing the real song of the life for that boy or a girl. So, AC by A ratio says that, oh, there is no hypermetropia, accommodation is excessive. That is the reason. So, this also is greater for near because fundamental problem is hyperactive accommodation which is responsible for this isotropia. So, if you if you use plus 3D glasses for the near vision, then this excessive use of accommodation become neutralized and this uh, isotropia will improve, right? Then you have mixed type. That is, there is a refractive error which is hypermetropia, but that can't explain why this much a high AC by A ratio is there. So, they already have excessive AC by A ratio which can't simply be explained by the degree of hypermetropia. Then it is a mixed type, both types. Summarize, doctor. Typically in isotropia, excessive accommodation will be there. It can be because of an underlying refractory error which is hypermetropia or it can be without any refractive error itself with a high AC by A ratio. Whatever it is, we need to basically correct them with plus positive lenses. So that is what we need to do. Let us see an example. Typically this child is having a high AC by A ratio. So, he is using the spectacles which corrected his complete hypermetropia. Still, isotropia is there. You are able to see? Because the high AC by A ratio. So, what you have done? You have used a bifocal segment to that lens and corrected that AC by A. And then, once more, the eyes came into a primary position without any isotropia. So, that is what you need to basically remember. Then without any problem in there is no excessive accommodation, still isotropia is there. What is the reason? There is an entity called essential without any reason, infantile isotropia, otherwise congenital isotropia, they are born with isotropia. Here we do not know what is the underlying reason, idiopathic. This is the favorite MCQ of the examiner. Essential infantile isotropia. Generally it will manifest by about 1 to 2 months of age itself after the baby is born. And in this the amount of screen how much? Very large, not 5 degree, 10 degree, 15 degree, 30 degrees of large squint will be there. That is called as essential infantile isotropia. Now, this is an example of a baby who is born at 1 to 2 months of age only, there is a significant amount of isotropia and the amount of isotropia can't be explained by either hypermetropia, it can't be explained by any sort of AC by A ratio, it is not due to any problem in the excessive accommodation. Then you call it as idiopathic infantile isotropia. Done doc? Now, can there be any secondary causes? For the development of isotropia, now we became experts. What can lead to development of a medial deviation? Any monocular lesion in the childhood, which either prevents the development of a normal binocular lesion or interfere with its maintenance, like a congenital cataract, congenital ptosis, congenital aphakia, anisometropia, optic atrophy, retinoblastoma, you should not forget, can lead to development of isotropia. This is one of the favorite MCQs of the examiner. What is the typical type of strabismus with which a retinoblastoma child will be born? Isotropias can be there 
can be a presenting feature if there is a retinoblastoma, medial deviation of the eye, 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 eyeball. Now, there is something called consecutive uh, isotropia. Somebody who had an exotropia, you have overcorrected and it ended up in isotropia. Right? Now, let us talk about exotropia. See, exotropia is nothing but the converse. All these principles are reversed. You need to start thinking reverse of all these things. Outward deviation of the eye, whenever the eye is fixating, when the other eye is fixating. I will give you one example. A 13 year old myopic girl, hypermetropes have isotropia. Myopes will have exotropia. I will show her uh, clinical picture, but before that I am giving a short case study for you to remember. She developed a left exotropia. Left eye is deviated out in the primary position. This left or right? This is right, right? Oh. Okay. Uh, whenever she is wearing the glasses, both the eyes have come into a primary position. Whenever she is looking towards a near object also, there is no exotropia. Near object may which will worsen, iso or exo? Iso will worsen. But she is fixating on to a distant object. And her right, right eye has gone into exotropia when she is fixating on to a distant object. So you should remember myopia, Distant fixation equal to exotropia. Hypermetropia, near fixation, accommodation excess or a refractive error leads to high AC by A ratio is equal to or the buzzwords you need to remember about to isotropias. Okay, doc. Now, how will you evaluate? A case of non paralytic concomitant strabismus. Very simple. First thing, what will you do? Check the refractive error. Test the vision. Correct the refractive error. Then we do the direct cover test. It confirms that there is a manifest squint. The patient is asked to fixate a point light. Then the normal looking eye is covered. Blah, blah, blah. Already we discussed cover test for what we will do. Then, uh, in case of tropias, in the primary position only the eye is deviated, no? Can we have some objective way of assessing how much the deviation is there? Very simple. You throw the light on the cornea. Look for the deviation of the corneal reflex. Depending upon the deviation of the corneal reflex, you will be knowing whether there is a isotropia, medial or lateral deviation. And how much deviation is there also, you can be able to gradiate. So that is basically called as Hirschberg's corneal reflex test. The patient is asked to fixate to a point of light which is being held at a distance of about 33 centimeters. And... Uh, you need to throw the light and look for the reflex of the light on the cornea. Normal people may it will be like this. If somebody is having isotropia, then what will happen? The deviation of the corneal reflex away from the pupil will be there. And uh, how will you calculate uh, the degree of isotropia or exotropia using this? Suppose when the corneal reflex falls on the border of the pupil, then uh, the amount of the angle of squint is taken as 15 degrees. If it goes and falls on the border of all the way limbus, corneoscleral junction, then the amount of deviation is being taken as 45 degrees. If it falls towards the inner limbus, it is isotropia. If it falls towards the outer limbus, it becomes exotropia. Simple doctor. Now, prism and cover test. Krimsky's corneal reflex test. Using a synoptophore. 
any of this fundamentally are testing the amount of angle of deviation of the corneal reflex to gradiate the degree of uh, uh, to grade the degree of uh, uh, iso and exotropias then there are few tests which are used to know how is the binocular vision is there any sensory image perception which got uh, blocked responsible for the tropias you can do that by any of these tests works four dot test only the names you need to remember of course if you still have interest in uh, library you can also go through the logic behind it but for undergraduate level it is beyond the scope after image test they are all fundamentally testing the amount of uh, uh, the tropias and the degree of sensory dysfunction then uh, you can also use a synoptophore which is also called amblyoscope to know the sensory dysfunction now comes an important question how will you treat a concomitant strabismus doctor whether exo or or uh, uh, isotropia same principles give the spectacles give a full correction of refractive error most of the times it will resolve then we is an occlusion therapy suppose if there is an amblyopia and a sensory deprivation which is responsible for the tropias then you try to uh, do the occlusion as a therapy favorite question asked about the by the examiner anyway we will take amblyopia as a separate topic until what age group you can use the occlusion therapy in isotropia below the age of 10 years you can still use the occlusion therapy then we do orthoptic exercises then squint surgery where we either we weaken or we either we strengthen so that's what we ultimately will be doing now still if you have energy want to comments about this squint surgery in case of medial rectus 1 mm resection will correct the tropias by about 1 to 1.5 degrees 1 mm 1 mm recession shortening lengthening we said no will correct 2 to 2.5 similarly in lateral rectus what are the values what is the maximum allowable cutting you can do these are not high yield questions for the examiner but still in the last uh, my obsession could not stop me from adding it into the notes i don't think it was never asked it may not be asked even if it is asked none will answer there's a murphy's law do you think you will remember all these things and also remembers slow sand filter sand the particle size in spm difficult doctor life has more beautiful things to remember my wedding days birthday party days etc eh? now doctor comes a very important question before we conclude paralytic non paralytic squint now you are all very confident how is the onset paralytic is always sudden non paralytic ko bahut history hai bachpan mein cataract aa gaya doctor sahab fir bhi hum cataract nahi nikalwaya iske wajah se ab ye ladke ko right side left side ja rahe hai eyeball story is little slow diplopia in case of paralytic skin it is usually present because of the limitation of the ocular movement whenever you are turning towards your left side one eye is moving other is saying i don't come with you diplopia paralytic skin there is concomitant skin me primary position me there is a deviation but if you want to move left and right laterally if you want to move eyes you are able to move where is diplopia there will be no diplopia then ocular movements are limited to one particular direction which is the direction of the action of the paralyzed muscle in paralytic squint but in case of the non paralytic movements are not affected then false projection of the image as yesterday we discussed you know paralytic uh, strabismus pain that won't be a problem in this people the head posture is normal but in this case the head will be shifted to a direction which is in the direction of the action of the paralyzed muscle nausea vertigo are typically a feature of paralytic two two images dikhayega na 
secondary deviation is more than primary in paralytic but not in non paralytic and in all cases pathological consequences overaction then uh, underaction all these problems long term consequences which are problem in paralytic but not in non paralytic as i told you this is an example of an isotropic eyeball and what are you able also able to see leukocoria which is because of the underlying retinoblastoma so retinoblastoma can lead to isotropias is what you need to basically remember